Virginia, and the Carolinas. So early history. Now we're going to specifically get to North Carolina and we're going to talk about the relationship between whites, Indians, and Africans in North Carolina. So Roanoke fails and the English go up to Jamestown and they establish a settlement in, in the Chesapeake in Jamestown, Virginia. They grow that settlement again, kidnapping Native Americans and selling them into slavery, you know, and using them on their plantation and many of the early planters taking Powhatan women as their wives. Uh, very few old families of Virginia um, are pure white. They have Indian ancestry. Walter Ashley Plecker, um, who introduced eugenics, introduced it to the Germans. I mean, it's, you know, eugenics started in Virginia, in the South. The notion of inferior peoples. Wanted to have Virginia change the law to classify anyone with any blood other than white to be colored. And the state legislature in Virginia balked because to do such a thing would have meant all the wealthy families in Virginia, all of the elites of Virginia would have been classified as colored and would have been discriminated against. And they refused to do so. So the history of Virginia and the Chesapeake is the same as the history of North Carolina. Any peoples that trace their ancestry back as early as 1607 or to the 1600s, they often uh, intermixed with native women. They took native women as wives. Same thing happened on plantations in terms of some, in many cases, forcibly or sometimes, you know, freely. But native and African peoples intermixed and intermarried in Virginia. And as the Virginians moved down from the Chesapeake into northeastern North Carolina, as they explore the areas of eastern North Carolina and make contact with the native peoples of eastern North Carolina, what we will see is this process continues to occur as they move down from Virginia. So we have significant numbers of people moving down from Virginia who are already mixed with mixing with the native populations and we also see uh, slavery beginning to grow and to expand as it moves down into northeastern North Carolina and so you have enslaved people many of whom are of native ancestry but then of course layered on top of by Africans who come in 1619 and again this year commemorates uh, the fact that the first black indentured servants were brought to Virginia in 1619. So after 1619, we see a growing black indentured population, which eventually turns into a slave population, and we have large numbers of African slaves in northeastern North Carolina moving down into, uh, moving down from Virginia into northeastern North Carolina. Okay. So the pattern, as these lines indicate, if you look to your uh, right, and you see the lines, uh, the lines are indicating early settlement between 1690, or around 1690, but 1600 to 1690, northeastern North Carolina, what today would be Pasquotank, Coratuck, Camden, um, Chowan, and um, Perquimans counties, and then on over by 1705 into eastern uh, Bertie County, which now includes Gates County, Hertford County, Northampton County, Halifax County, Martin County, Washington County, or Beaufort County. And we see the expansion, particularly after the Tuscarora War. The dark gray area on the map indicates English. And we see, of course, that movement of people as they expand tobacco plantations and movement down into that region. So we're talking about the evolution of the slave society starting as indentured servitude, and even indentured servants were, for all intents and purposes, treated like slaves, so the indentured servants ran away as well. But if they ran away to the frontier, they often were taken in by Native Americans, and the Native Americans basically allowed them to live as free people. So we have the foundation laid for slavery, right? Early slavery in the 1600s. And it is an Indian slavery, African slavery, and for all intents and purposes, a white slavery, because white indigenous servitude was slavery. And when these people blended and they produced mixed children who were part Indian and black, part Indian and white, part Indian, black, and white, they were still enslaved as Virginia changed their laws to enslave people of color. And still all of these people are experiencing uh, this situation in northeastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia. 
So how does the Quaker influence come in? It's important to understand, and many people forget the early history of North Carolina. There were Quakers in what we call Albemarle County, which was the first county in northeastern North Carolina, the county that ended up developing Bertie, Hertford, Gates, Halifax, Northampton, uh, Edgecombe, Marble, as well as, as I said, Corita, Camden, Chowan, Perquimans, Pasquotank. And there were Quakers in the Albemarle County, and there were issues between the Quakers and the Anglicans. If you know early history, you know that the Quakers were not particularly liked by the Anglicans. Okay? A lot of religious conflict. Catholics didn't get along with Protestants, but in, within the Protestant faith, you have Quakers and you have Anglicans, and they don't get along either. And the Anglicans, you know, passed law to raise taxes on all the settlers in the Albemarle region, including the Quakers, to build churches, Anglican churches. Not Quaker churches, Anglican churches. And the Quakers are not very happy about that. So what we see is that the Quakers actually, and based on their religion and their faith and how they treated people, they were in conflict with the Anglicans, they were in conflict with the English government, the governor of Virginia and later North Carolina, they were in conflict with the ruling uh, Protestants, the ruling Anglicans, and they tended to actually have better relations with the Indians than they did with their fellow whites. The main stronghold of the Quakers, particularly after the 1680s, however, is going to be in Pennsylvania, at Philadelphia. William Penn will establish the city of Philadelphia, and he establishes it with the support of what we call the Iroquois Confederacy, the Five Nations. And so Quakers are thriving and growing in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, and they're thriving and growing because of their friendly relations with what we call the Five Nations, who control not just New York State, but much of Pennsylvania, and even into the Ohio Valley, uh, Eastern Ohio, and eventually all of the Ohio Valley, um, will be under their influence and control. The era, of course, have great respect for the Quakers. The Quakers are fair-minded people. The Quakers keep their word. The Quakers are pacifists for the most part and do not believe in warfare. So the Five Nations and most Native peoples have very good relationships with the Quakers. And so what we will see is that these routes that the Natives use to wage war on each other, to trade with one another back and forth between Pennsylvania and New York State will eventually become wagon roads as Scots Scotch-Irish and additional Quakers will move down out of Pennsylvania into the Piedmont of Virginia and North Carolina and basically continue to maintain those friendly relations that they have had and that they have with the Iroquois Confederacy and their allies. By 1675, the Senecas have taken control of all of the backcountry of Virginia. Um, the Piedmont of Virginia, everything beyond the fall line, we call it the fall line, which begins the coastal plains and the tide water of Virginia and North Carolina, belong to the Six Nations, belong to the Iroquois Confederacy. It is well recorded in the colonial records of Virginia that the five nations, the Mohawks, the Onondagas, the Cayudas, the Senecas, um, the Oneidas, and the Tuscaroras, always refused to return one of runaway slaves. When Africans ran away in Maryland, when Africans ran away in Virginia, when Africans ran away in North Carolina, and they entered Iroquois territory, they refused to return them. They would not give back runaway slaves. No matter how much the whites tried to negotiate for them and demand them, they refused to give them back. So it's important to understand that when we're talking about early Virginia, North Carolina, and we talk about the influence of the Quakers in that region, it's important to understand that the Quakers were more in line and aligned with the native peoples that were in northeastern North Carolina, bordering their territories, than they were with their fellow English, who were Anglicans and really mistreated them uh, oftentimes. Okay. So this is the early history of slavery.
the evolution of slavery in North Carolina and the early relationship between Quakers and enslaved peoples who tended to be people of native descent, some Africans beginning to be filtered in, and also white indentured servants who were mixing with the natives and the Africans that would be in brought in. I did want to make one other point, and I'll try to be a little briefer and move accelerate a little faster. Um, and I'm not sure how much time we set aside. But keep me, keep me on time. I think we we set aside until about ten forty-five. Okay. So just keep me, you know, keep me um, appraised of the time, so that I won't go over. Uh, but I, I don't think I will. So I do also want to take this opportunity to just point out the the differences in peoples in the region in North Carolina as pertains to enslaved people and mixed race people. Uh, first of all, I wanted to point out that there are three types of mixed people or people of African descent or African Indian or mixed race descent because as far as Virginia was concerned, they were all Negroes, they were all people of color. If you had any kind of mix, if it was Indian and white, you were mulatto. If it was Indian and black, you were mulatto. If it 